Hello students, welcome to uh, cellular respiration. That's what we're going to be introducing today in our topic. And this is uh, a topic that we've alluded to many times in many of the different videos. And we're going to specifically start um, talking about cellular respiration today. So the first thing that we need, um, want to talk about is the idea of combustion. So if you look at this candle here, um, we can see that there is a fire that's happening. So something is being combusted. In fact, to learn a little bit more about this, let's watch this short video. So here we have a candle. We're going to light it. And then we take this uh, jar and we, you know, we've stuck the candle inside of this silly putty so that it'll s stay standing upright. And we put the jar and we screw the jar um, on. Now, you probably already know what might happen here, right? As we continue to watch this and watch this and watch this, watch what happens to the flame, pretty soon it extinguishes. Now what happened? Well, most of you probably um, have already been able to guess that one of the ingredients that's required for that flame to continue to, uh, to burn ran out, right? Which ingredient was it? Was it there wasn't enough of the, of the wick? And you know, you've got the wax, you've got the wick, which is mostly uh, a carbohydrate type of a, a, of a structure. And then um, there's um, one other ingredient. And the other ingredient is, of course, the air. And so the air ran out. So as we look at combustion, it's simply some type of carbohydrate, the wax and the wick, combined with oxygen. and that, that, those are the reactants, and the reactants react to each other, and they give off carbon dioxide and water, usually in the form of water vapor, in, in this case where, where um, it was combusting in, as a flame, and then there was light and heat that was also given off. So we get heat and light, and um, the reason that it stopped combusting was because we had no more oxygen, and so the reaction stopped. So combustion is an, ex, an exergonic reaction. And so in this case, there, in, in an exergonic reaction, typically you need a little bit of energy to get, the, to get the reaction going. But once it gets going, much more energy is released overall, much more than what was, what was needed to go into it. And so you get this extreme burst of a lot of energy, right? Typically in combustion, we, we perceive this as light and heat, right? You're around a campfire, you can feel the heat, you can see the light. Recall that we've also talked about fluorescence. And in this graph, we showed that you can take, you know, one of those stars, those glow-in-the-dark stars, you can shine light on it. So you're putting photons or energy in, and the energy increases, increases, increases. But then gradually, the energy is released instead of all of once in combustion, where you get these um, electrons that are, that are dropping from one energy state to another, and the photons are coming out. That's what's given off. And so those glow stars continue to glow for a long time. But they give off the energy a little bit at a time, not all at once. Again, in combustion, um, this energy is released all at once as heat and light. And the, the, you can think of this a very si in a very similar way as the fluorescence in that you have these electrons on these really high energy levels and then they drop all at once to a lower energy level. In the case of you know, the burning flame of the candle, these electrons were dropping from very high energy down to a very low energy, and the molecule that was receiving these electrons was oxygen. Oxygen is a very good um, uh, electron receiving molecule. And then these oxygen molecules separate into just one oxygen atom and combine with hydrogen to make the water that's part of the, um, the equation over here, right? <clears throat> So as we compare these two different ways of taking an energy source and, and then getting energy from that energy source, the, in the case of the, of the glowing stars, it was, getting, it was taking all of that energy that was put in and taking out a little bit at a time in these successive steps. And in the case of combustion, it was taking a lot of available energy 
adding just a little bit of energy to get the reaction going and then and then getting a lot of energy out of that but getting all of that energy out at once well what we'd like to do in the body is kind of take the best parts of both of those different reactions and combine those in the body because we definitely don't want to use up all the energy all at once because we would combust and burst into flame um, but we want to be able to take advantage of very high energy molecules that have lots of energy that are available but take the energy out a little bit at a time so in this case in the case of the you know the burning um, candle where did this high energy compound come from well it was the wick and the wax right which is essentially lots of carbohydrates <clears throat> and how did those um, molecules get so energized in the first place well the um, wick and wax as being carbohydrates came initially from some product usually a plant that put all of those compounds together and spent a lot of energy putting them together into a high energy um, containing compound um, such as a carbohydrate and so plants are the answer to doing that plants are the things that ha that make these high energy compounds for us so in our bodies if we apply this now to us and thinking more about what's happening the energy molecule that we most um, take advantage of is glucose now glucose remember is a monomer of a carbohydrate you are you can have these chains and chains and chains of glucose right so you eat you know pasta pasta is broken down and broken down until it becomes glucose and then the glucose is that molecule that is used in in this type of reaction in our body where the glucose combined with air reacts and we take advantage of the energy a little bit at a time to get carbon dioxide water and energy and in this case instead of you know getting tons of heat and tons of light what we want is just a little bit of energy at a time and in fact we take advantage of those little little tiny energy steps and we put all of that into making ATP so once again we take the high energy molecule of glucose we take advantage of air the electron receptor uh, acceptor we slowly run this reaction a little bit at a time we still end up with the same products of carbon dioxide and water but instead of making a flame we simply make ATPs so the energy from all of these sugars are actually founds in the bonds from one carbon to the next it's this this covalent bond between one carbon and another carbon that holds these high energy electrons and when we when that bond is broken you can think of it in very in a very simple way as if two electrons come out of that two high energy electrons come out of breaking that bond so for our bodies not to burst into flames with the explosive release of energy we can only break then we're only going to break one bond at a time we're not going to break all the bonds all at once and use all of the energy all at once so if you take a six carbon molecule you break it in half you got two electrons out of that right now we don't know how our, our these electrons though just can't keep just stay floating around they have to be stored for a little bit of time and the way that we store these is using another molecule by putting the electrons back into a bond and so these high energy electrons are stored somewhere else until we're ready to use them and the molecule that we use is NADH NADH and NADH is an electron carrier molecule it can take on those electrons and store them until they're ready to be used so if you think about it we've already broke that six carbon molecule once if we break uh, each of the three carbon molecules now we get more electrons and we add those to our NADH molecules and then we can break those final two carbon um, uh, carbon to carbon bonds and we get more electrons and we add those again to NADH molecules these electron carriers and now we've got all these electrons that are that are on these molecules ready to be used when we need to use them now the third rule that we want to highlight is that these stored electrons are very high in energy and they are quite explosive they could be 
So we're just going to take them down from energy level to energy level a little bit at a time as we release a little bit of energy. So how do we do this? Well, consider this. The energy that's extracted each time the electron drops, right, from one energy shell to the next, that amount of energy can be used in a, to do something in the body. And in this case, what we're going to use it for is to move molecules across a membrane against its concentration gradient, so active transport, right? And the molecule we're going to be moving across to the membrane are hydrogen ions. So we take these hydrogen ions and we move them across the membrane against the concentration gradient using active transport. Then, once we've set up now a really high concentration gradient with lots of hydrogen ions on one side and very few on another side, we can open up a channel and allow those hydrogen ions to flow back through the membrane and take advantage of that flow, of that flow and, and build ATP from that. And, that, and then the, as the hydrogen ions move, move back across, the electrons then are now have, have continuously moved from a high energy state to a lower energy state as they've gone through this entire process of, of pumping hydrogen ions across. Then they come back across and then the final acceptor of those electrons once again is oxygen, which then you know, breaks apart into two uh, atoms and then is combined with hydrogen to make water. So it's something like this. Right? We take those high energy electrons, we take a little bit of energy out of them at a, at a time, and as we do that, we're pumping, we're moving hydrogen ions from one side of the membrane to another, from on this side where it would be low concentration to the other side where it would be high concentration. And then now that we've set up a high concentration of hydrogen ions on this side, we can open up a very special channel this little molecular turbine called ATP synthase, and as the hydrogen ions flow back through to the other side, this um, turns this, this molecule, this very special channel, and it, and it powers it so that it can make ATP. And so that's really what the whole point of doing all of, all of this was to set up a, a concentration gradient so that as these molecules move back across, we can then churn out lots and lots of ATPs. And that's the uh, introduction to cellular respiration. We'll continue to learn more about that in other um, activities in this course.